Welcome to Canada's podcast. This podcast is brought to you by Schneider Electric, supporting Canadian businesses with innovative energy management and automation solutions. Schneider Electric, your digital partner for sustainability and efficiency. Hi, this is Celine Williams hosting for Canada's podcast. My guest today is Joe Real, Vice President Data Center Solution Architects at Schneider Electric. In his role, he is responsible for bringing together the full suite of Schneider Electric products and services to provide unparalleled, right-sized, innovative, and complete solutions for their customers. Joe, welcome to the show. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Hi, Celine. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's really an honor for me to be here. And I really look forward to having this dialogue. Thanks again for having me. I, it is my pleasure, truly. I'm really excited to hear more about what you do, but also about what Schneider Electric is up to these days, because I know it's a, it's a very well established and large organization. That's always fascinating to hear about. So I appreciate you being here. Well, thanks for having me. Let's, uh, (laughs) let's get rolling and see what we can get ourselves into here. Um, so, at, so here at Canada's podcast, we are all about sharing the stories of how people ended up doing what they're doing, right? Whether they're an entrepreneur or a business owner or an executive or whatever it is, we want to, we like to share the stories because people really connect to how we got to where we got, right? So I'd love yeah. to share some of your journey with our audience, you know, maybe where you started, your background, and and how you got to this role that you're in right now of VP Data Center Solution Architect. Well, I am, well, first of all, again, I'm honored to be here and thank you so much. And wow, what a, what a, what a question. I- Big and broad, Joe, uh, I like to start big and broad. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I, I'll start out by saying, you know, um, I, I'll start by saying this, first of all, there's no such thing as luck. And, and, and I'll give you a quick story. I'm going to tell you how I got to where I'm at. Okay. So there's no such thing as luck. So if two people are fishing, you're Celine in the front of the boat, I'm in the back of the boat. You're paying attention. You're prepared for an opportunity. I'm in the back of the boat. I'm looking at the trees, the birds, the houses, this, that, and the other thing. A fish comes and bites my line and I miss it. But you're in the front of the boat, same bait, same everything, two, 10 feet apart. You catch the fish. Why? Because you're prepared for the opportunity. Mm. So, so let's start with that. That's how we're going to start the conversation is, is, is for everybody is opportunity is all around you at all times. And you don't even realize it a lot of times. And but if you're prepared for those opportunities and you're more prepared than the next person, then you're more apt to get that opportunity to move forward. So let's start there. And my background is I grew up actually and I'm familiar with Canada. I grew up in uh, Niagara Falls, New York. And so Niagara Falls, Ontario, St. Catharines, Mississauga, I played hockey were all places I frequented very much and very fond of and uh, have great memories there. So I. uh, I did that. I played hockey, and um, I have a I have a shattered wrist here that ended my my uh, hockey career. And this is when I joined the United States Air Force, and I had no idea. By the way, I'm the oldest of many children, and my dad was going to pay for my college, and I didn't want him to do that. So I was going to join the military, figure it out for myself, and. I'm not much of a swimmer, so the Navy was out. I didn't like camping that much, so that uh, Marines and Army were out. So I was, I joined the Air Force. I took a test, did well, took another test, did well. I ended up in a nuclear program for the United States Air Force. So I was working on intercontinental ballistic missiles, um, the Minuteman III weapon system, and I got my education in power, refrigeration, electronics, doing that. And... Uh, I decided to move on from the uh, Air Force after my four-year commitment. And uh, I used that training and I I started working in building automation and building controls and work for Siemens. And then I kind of just just moved up through the organization. And I'm gonna gonna talk about that in a second as to how, if you will, or why, and what's a good trait, I think. 
And uh, I, I, I ran a, a Southeast region for Siemens technical support. And then from there, I um, became a dad. And um, the best job of all. Yes, ma'am. You are, not, and and my at the time, my my girlfriend was not in the same city as I was, so I wasn't going to be um, a remote dad. So that was out. So I ended up um, moving and to where my child was, and um, and was a dad, and uh, I I I. And this is this is the I think an interesting part of the story. I couldn't find an exact job that you know you you say I this is what I do. So, but there was a job about mission critical facilities, and I thought to myself, wait, I, I was in a nuclear program. I was in the most intensive mission critical facility you could ever imagine, mm. seventy two feet below the earth, and electronics and computer, all kinds of things happening. Sounds like something for me. I had no idea what a data center was actually at that time. Okay, so I I applied for this facilities mission critical, and next thing you know, um, within six months, I was uh, kind of running uh, a small city for Bank of America on their mission critical portfolio, their data center portfolio, and soon after that, about six months after that, they asked me to take on the rest of the world and um so i was now then a senior vice president engineering service executive for bank of america um, responsible for data centers globally um, and then really the financial crisis hit um in 2007 and 8 and um it was then that it, it, uh, how do I want to say? Sometimes uh, you you wake up one day and you kind of figure out that I, it, you either you can live to work or work to live. Mm -hmm. And as a father, I wasn't sure that I had my balance correct there. And so I actually um, decided to make a change on my own. And I I had worked with a number of companies at my role at Bank of America, one that stood out most was Schneider Electric. Um, their people, their culture, what they wake up every morning to do was make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. That is a much different um, vision than maybe a financial institution may have. Right. Uh, and so that fit me quite well. And I, uh, I was lucky enough to kind of do my job honorably and, and uh, et cetera. So, and I had a lot of opportunities from external companies while at the bank. And uh, I decided that I was going to uh, accept and uh, pick up the phone of all these people that said, call when you want to. So I did. I called when I wanted to. And um, I've been at Schneider Electric now for nine years. Um, I, I said it just getting here. You know, we literally we really do we wake up in the morning trying to make the world a better place we're, we're we're incredibly focused on diversity and equality we're incredibly focused on the globe and the planet and sustainability um one of the most uh, ethical companies in the world one of the most sustainable companies in the world and gosh if you just think about that who wouldn't want to get up and go to work for somebody like that so um that's my journey a little bit um there's a couple of little things in there just for some folks maybe to take away is you know it's 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 okay to kind of to 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 realize and make a change it's okay to to figure that out and selena during the introduction you said something i thought was impactful to me and you talked about being curious and curiosity and i'll say this to people uh it's one of the most important traits that you could have. Um, curious people are people that want to figure it out. How does it work? Why does it work? How can I make it a little bit better? How can I do this or that? Mm. Being curious. If you're curious, you're going to be incredibly successful in life. And success is not guaranteed 
by the size of your house or the size of your salary. Okay. Success is a lot more than that. And we've all, I think many of us have come to that realization through the pandemic. But when you were talking and, and you have a wonderful story yourself, and it was a pleasure to uh, have that dialogue, but that that curiosity uh, trait that you have is is one that I wanted to share with the audience to say it, it's an overlooked trait that many people don't talk about, but it's one of the most impactful traits that you can have as a human. And when you have that trait, you're going to find wonderful success mm-hmm. and, and happiness because you're going to figure it out. You can't be curious and not go figure it out. You, 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 you are drawn to that naturally. So I want to say I very much appreciate you saying that. And it is very clear from your story that you have a lot of curiosity as well. And I think the fact that you started with there is no such thing as luck is the type of thing that someone who is naturally curious, who is going to look at something like the the, you know, the a data center job that I recognize was not called that and say, oh, I can link this to the other things that I've done, even though it might not be the most obvious thing up front, because I'm asking questions and being curious about it. That is, you exhibit this and it is, you know, from from the story that I just heard and that our listeners just heard, it is clearly a key piece of your success. Yes, well, you know, I, that. thank you for that. I'm not sure I realized that at the time. I, I I maybe have realized it now, but at the time I, I didn't realize that maybe. And uh, I, you know, sometimes uh, you look back at things and you say, "Wow!" I mean, I, I it you know something else I'll say. You know, I never woke up to say I'm going to be in the United States Air Force nuclear program. Never once did I say that. Never once did I say. You're going to be an SVP engineering executive at Bank of America. And never once did I wake up and say, I want to be a vice president at Schneider Electric. These are things that I talked about. It's like a back of the boat fishing. Mm-hmm. I was prepared for the opportunity and, and, and I was able to take advantage of the opportunity. Mm-hmm. And then you said something that I'd like to just get into just for one second, um, which I think is super impactful. It's just because you never have, that doesn't mean that you can't, okay? And I think that limits people. Oh, I've never done that before. Or I, I don't think that I can. Yeah, you can. You absolutely can. Um, you, 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 you can do it. Um, it is not, I mean, if yeah, you never walked, you were a baby. If you, if you adopted that, you'd still be crawling, right? So, like, you can do it. And you just have to tell yourself that you can't do it and believe in yourself. And, and one of the things I coach a national fast pitch girls softball team, uh, I did. Uh, my daughter's now playing fast pitch college, college softball. Um, one of the things that I told, I say uh, my team, but I don't mean it that way. The girls, uh, well, young ladies mm-hmm. on the team was, I asked them all, do you brush your teeth in the morning? And of course they went, yeah, duh, Coach Joe, yes, <laughs> right? And I said, okay, I, here's what I want you to do tomorrow morning and do this every day now, the rest of your life. You're going to be amazed at this. When you brush your teeth, I want you to look at yourself in the mirror and, 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 and I want you to tell yourself the world's a better place because you're in it, okay? You, 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 you brush your teeth every morning and you're just doing it in the mirror most likely, right? So just tell yourself the world's a better place because you're in it. And if you don't believe me, let me go ask your mom or your grandfather, your, your brother, or go ask Coach Joe, right? And every one of us is going to say, oh, my God, of course. So I want you to believe that the world's a better place the minute you walk out of that bathroom. And here's what you're going to do because of that. You're going to realize that, holy cow, I'm in it and I can make the world. You're going to hold the door open for somebody. You're going to say thank you for somebody. You're going to do something. You're going to feel empowered to go out in the world and say, here I am, and I am valuable, and this, this place is better because I'm in it, I'll in it and show you, and it immediately changes your behavior, okay? Yeah. And what you, what you start to see is people gain confidence, people gain the ability. I don't have to be a VP to make an impact on somebody. I don't have to be a certain title or a certain 
wealth or a certain this to make an impact on people. No, you don't. Okay. You, 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 you can make that impact as to who you are, embrace who you are. World's a better place because you're in it. So, you know, all of those things I think I've adopted in my life. Okay. Which has helped get me to where I am. Yeah. I never thought that I couldn't do it because I'm stubborn. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, yeah, I can do it. I'm like the little four year old that's never thrown a fishing line. I, Dad, I got it. I can do it. Yeah. You can? Yeah. Right. So, like, those are the things I think that have sort of, I would say, defined me a little bit, mm -hmm. Celine, but also led me to where I'm at. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so as a long story, um, but that's, that's how I got here in a way. Um, it's, thank you for sharing all of that. And it immediately, I talk a lot about leadership being about behavior, because I talk about leadership. So this is my nerdy hat. Right. Awesome. I talk a lot about leadership being about behavior, not about title or authority. It's about how we show up. Doesn't make a difference what title you have doesn't make it but the way we show up that is what leadership that is what leadership really is and what you've just said tells me that you are a person who deeply deeply understands and lives that and encourages it in other people which is the you know sharing with the the young athletes on the on the fast pitch team to to you know speak into the mirror that's exactly what it is it is a behavior that you are encouraging in yourself and other people to show up regardless of who they are where they're at and that is such i love that piece of your story and i really wanted to highlight it because i think it's really important for people to 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 look to to hear what you're saying and not get stuck on oh well you know joe has this title and joe has the yeah, Joe might have those things. Joe hasn't always had those things. Right. But what Joe does have is that behavior and that attitude that has clearly served him well to get to where to where you are right now. And I just want to speak that out loud because I think it's really it's very obvious to me. And I appreciate you sharing all of that. Well, thank you for that. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I, I am really curious because you mentioned you met, obviously you mentioned Schneider Electric and you mentioned you know, some of what they're up to in the world. I want to know more of that. But even, you know, for the, the folks in our audience who don't know a lot about Schneider Electric in general, can you kind of give us, and we're totally going to get into the sustainability. I have a lot of questions about that sort of piece. But before that, can you sort of give us general sense of what Schneider Electric does? Because clearly, it's impactful enough and important enough that you from an outside perspective identified that is the type of place i want to work yeah well uh it we are a a, a very very large global company we're headquartered in grenoble france mm -hmm. uh we have an um an, an incredible executive leadership team who has had an unbelievable vision and mission for us and, and, and all of my teammates worldwide. And what we do, I would say we're, we're, we're the world leader in energy management. And we manufacture major electrical equipment. If you think about um, the trail of electricity, somebody produces it and then they transport it and then they distribute it. And Schneider Electric makes hardware and software along the entire electrical train all the way inside of a data center to the plug at which the computer actually plugs into. So Schneider Electric makes electrical hardware. Mm -hmm. um, we are found in mining and minerals, water and wastewater, data centers, healthcare, buildings, just office buildings. We play a role in utility electrical utilities, natural gas, oil and gas. And so we provide uh, equipment. All of our equipment is digitized and connectable. Um, so IoT, when people talk about IoT being a sensor, your watch or the meter or light switch on the wall, the products we make are digitally enabled and connectable. 
uh, and we're incredibly focused on, on, on digital, being able to embrace digital. And we really feel that energy, believe it or not, is a basic human right. And, and we say that in our company. And so um, when we say we're, we're a world leader of energy management, um, and, and we cover all of those uh, industries, and uh, but we we really say that that electricity and now digital is a is a basic human right, and so we we work to enable that for people uh, in places in the world, uh, and and we work with just about every client um, that you name or can think about we serve about all of them in some capacity or another and so uh, that's kind of what schneider electric does um, from a data center to a, a fully digitized and robotic uh factory mm-hmm. an industrial facility and even offshore rigging and so we do uh all of that and we do that i think i might have my numbers wrong here celine roughly around 160,000 employees, 178 countries. It's incredible. It's incredible. So yeah, it's uh, it's a, and it's really a great place to work. Uh, you know, I'm not saying it because I, I work, I don't, I'm not having to say this about Schneider right now. I'm a, I work here and there are many associates like myself. We actually want to work here. We don't work here because we have to. Um, I mentioned our executive leadership team and and our country leadership team. They really set the mark and the vision for us, and it's really an honor, actually, to work for good uh, good leaders. I, I uh, it's it's a wonderful place to work, and that's kind of what we try to do uh, around the world, not only for our clients but just the world in general. And then, by the way, we treat our people quite well. At Schneider Electric, we empower Canadian businesses to utilize energy and resources efficiently. Schneider Electric, the future of energy. It's really obvious that you, and I'm guessing this is reflected in other leaders and executive team as well, that you genuinely care and that you are committed to what Schneider Electric stands for. And I think that is clear in how you, how you speak about the company and how you speak about the team and, and, you know, so I, in doing research for this, poked around on your, on the website. And one of the things that really stood out to me is the credo that Schneider Electric has. I'm going to read it because I think it's really powerful. And I think it's very much reflected in what you just said, especially because there is such a clear commitment to positive impact in the world in general and specifically climate positive impact. And so the credo is, I'm, I am going to read this, otherwise I, I'm not good enough to memorize this sort of thing. Uh, Schneider's purpose is to empower all to make the most of our energy and resources, bridging progress and sustainability for all. And I say that because you spoke about electricity being a human right. And I think that that credo has that concept baked in, right? That idea that this is it's about innovation. It is about sustainability. It's about access for all. And I'd, I'd, I'd love to know a little bit more about what that looks like, how that shows up, um, this, whether it's a sustainability piece or the access for all, because I think it's clearly something that the company and you and your role presumably are passionate about. We are uh, passionate about that. And, you know, I think it even... I would say even goes a little bit beyond that too, with regards to just people uh, and and equalness, mm. and um, and and I would also say, which is, I think totally. This is probably going to sound a polar opposite to people, but do you know that I would suggest? that we at Schneider Electric actually don't want conformity. So I'll give you an example. This is a weird Joe thing, but I'll just do it. Okay. So like, imagine a bed of nails. 
Mm-hmm. And like the East Indian guru who lays on that bed of nails, I don't wonder why he doesn't get skewered. And it's because every nail is the same height. And every nail supports a small portion of the weight. And yet the entire weight is, is supported. And the only way that that is accomplished And again, this is a weird thing from a leader, but I'm just going to tell you right now, I don't want you to conform to me. If you conform to me, then I'm going to make one nail. How's that going to work out when he lays on it or she lays on it? When everybody conforms to me as the leader or the leader or whatever, you make one nail. The only way to achieve what we have achieved, I believe, at Schneider Electric, this is the unofficial Schneider statement from Joe, but the only way I, I, is that we, we didn't want conformity. We wanted individuality and individuals are the nails. And yes, there are organizational charts and yes, there are titles and yes, there are all those things. But at the end of the day, each one of our teammates, albeit maybe on a different place on the board of nail, is no higher than the other one. Okay. And so most people and teams, they all want conformity. That's very shallow. Um, You have to be very comfortable in your own leadership style and abilities and embrace that people are smarter than you and they can do things better than you and they can, but you embrace that as one and become better. And the way that you do that is, is, is you actually require individuality Mm. not conformity and so i mean i I would say that's kind of what our secret is to success a little bit believe it or not a giant company that actually wants its people to be individuals and to express themselves and to feel confident about that but not only that to do it in an ethical way uh with our clients and with our teammates right Uh, there used to be Maybe there still is in some parts of the world. The end justifies the means mm-hmm. where we could pollute 17 streams beyond the point of anything living in it, but the board is going to stand up and applaud because we made $3 a share. And that's not how it works for us. The, the, the means is important to us. And um, so, yeah, sustainability is, is, is a key piece. We know that climate change is here. We believe that. We know that we have to make change. We know that we have to make the most of our energy. We also know that we have to allow those who may not have that essential need, along with digital and digitization, to we need to enable the world with that. Not everybody has all those things. And so um, we we work hard to do those things. There's a number of programs in countries um, that that help that in local communities as well. I am not 100% versed on the magnitude of those programs that we, we do have. I do know that we, we spend an enormous amount of time and resources uh, in, our, in our local communities mm. of which we serve. I think it's really clear that the the commitment to, first of all, I love the idea of the the commitment to individuality, the unofficial statement, but that really is the commitment to diversity and equality that you mentioned up front, yes. which is where innovation comes from, right? It yes. is, it's always easier to have a room full of people that are going to agree with you. That is always going to be the easier choice. It doesn't mean it's the better choice, especially when it comes to innovation. And I think that to me is a really important takeaway and i want to highlight it inside of what you said because it was really evident that that is important and quite frankly that's what makes one of the things i'm not saying it's the only thing but it's one of the things that makes schneider electric successful and a a leader when it comes to innovation when it comes to digitization when it comes to these things yeah i would agree with that actually and you know it's um I, i would say this you know the world is um constantly changing it's constantly getting more electrified and more digitized Mm -hmm. right 
and 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 it's important on how we do that yeah and uh, and so it's um it's a wonderful place i think if anybody is interested in and and having a look where actually you can wake up in the morning and feel like when you go to bed at night you made a little bit of a difference you know give us a look yeah um i i'm gonna kind of jump onto something you said earlier if you don't mind or sure and that is the so some folks who are listening um know that i'm a climate reality leader so i'm really passionate about sustainability in general, but also bringing awareness to organizations, to things that are happening that um, kind of, you know, bring awareness to the climate crisis, to bring awareness of the realities of the world and who are, where organizations and people are looking at changing those things and working into it and speaking into it with the recognition that these things are real and happening. And so when you mentioned the, you know, the climate crisis and some of the, the, the specifics around um, the sustainability and what Schneider, Schneider Electric is doing. What I what I'm really curious about is, and this is me asking you very specifically based on your expertise. So I'm hoping this is okay. The intersectionality of data centers and sustainability, because I think there's lots of people one who don't fully understand data centers on their own, let alone where that idea or that intersectionality of sustainability would come into play. And I love because of your role and of the organization you're in, I'd love if you could just speak into that for a couple of minutes and, and you know, open our eyes to, to what that looks like, because I think it's okay. really important. Yeah, and it's, it's great. And I appreciate that question because I think, for first, let me talk about a data center. Please. Basically, everything that happens on our phones today um, actually goes through a data center uh, of some kind somewhere mm. and network. Uh, so anytime you're texting or TikToking or even going on Amazon and ordering whatever you order, this is all through data centers. And data centers are buildings that may be the size of a football field. And there's not any people in them, mostly six to eight people, maybe. But that football field, the building is consuming a tremendous amount of power. And I'm going to I'm going to talk to this in, in this way, Celine. I think you'll appreciate this. So everybody knows that. Digitization and the phones and social media and mobile uh, devices and tablets and computers and now watches and pretty soon glasses and everything else is all digitized. And as I said, it's all starting in the data center. And from 2010 to 2018, data center has grown 550%. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Um, but but here's here's the punchline. The energy needed to power those data centers only grew by six percent. Okay. Wow. So what we uh, started off with, there's a, a a high level measurement in data centers. It's it's power utilization effectiveness. Some people call it PUE, and so it's pretty easy. If I had one kilowatt to supply a computer. And if I had a whole nother kilowatt for the cooling and the lights, it's a PUE at two, basically. Okay. And data centers in the 2006, be prior to 2006, it was not uncommon for a data center to have a PUE of two, which is really bad. So that means if I had 10 megawatts of data center, I needed 20 megawatts of utility just to keep the lights on. Got it. Okay. From 2006 all the way out to 2017, we're starting now to see PUE at 1.2, 1.3. Okay. Significant reduction Ooh. in the consumption of energy for equipment that's required to, to cool, light, power up this stuff. 
Okay. And how did this happen? And this happened because the data center industry actually stood up and said, hey, hold on. Everything's becoming digital. Everything's becoming this. We're sucking a tremendous amount of power from the grid. Mm -hmm. If we don't figure out how to do it more efficiently, we can't power it anymore. So enter sustainable products, enter economizers, uh, outside air economizers. We're actually, we're using, if it's 54 degrees or 50 degrees outside, why not leverage some of that air? so that I don't have to run a lot of mechanical cooling, right? Yeah, we have to take care of particulates and filter, blah, blah, blah. We get into technical things. At the end of the day, it's cold outside. Hey, hello, you think we could use cold air to cool? It's free, right? We, we, we now have solar, we now have hydrogen fuel cells. These are all part of now data center technology that has helped to take away the electrical demand while at the same time allowing the things that we want, the new Uber to come and look, I can see my car driving around the corner. Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen in cyber, that happens in a data center. That data center requires a tremendous amount of power to, in order for it to work. And so the data center industry, I'll say it this way, I, and this is pretty impactful. When I started in the data center industry, sustainable things were, I, I, I'll admit it, uh, ashamedly so, but I'll admit it. Nonetheless, they were nice to have. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe five years ago, it shouldn't have been this way, but it was. Again, I'll admit to it. Okay. We moved the needle. We went from a uh, nice to have, guess what? We moved it to a should have. Big deal. Should have meant about 30, 40% adopted. Yeah. Guess what? Today, I, I would say that the data center industry and sustainability has now moved the needle to must have. Okay. All right. So it, it, I don't see a client or a data center that doesn't have a sustainability something in it. OK, um, even OEM providers like Schneider, um, we play a role in that Yeah. by what if we made products that didn't care about where they came from or how they were made? We don't make every single component that's in our thing, right? So our partners, our supply chain, right, uh, need to meet sustainable requirements in order to be a partner for us. So our products are, are built with sustainability in mind, our supply chain, to decarbonize our supply chain. These are all part of and components of um, helping not only the data center industry, but industries really reduce their carbon footprint. And it's complicated. Um, and it's, it, 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 but it's not, it's not unmanageable. Hmm. I think, it, it, you know, there's a, a couple of four little things that maybe you could think about. The first thing is you got to realize you need to do it. Right? And, and, and you, you know, you need to set a plan. Right? and a vision mm -hmm. and those are those are easy to do right um, and so when you set that plan and you start to you start to set that vision and you, you you start to give yourself measurable and obtainable goals mm -hmm. along that way mm -hmm. some at bats if you will um and then hit a couple of singles using a sports analogy yeah right um and and what you find yourself sort of matriculating down the path to, to really starting to make an impact. Don't wake up one day to think that you're going to be able to go carbon neutral and, and, and to it's be, be, be real, set manageable goals, but you got to set first, understand you have to do it, set the plan, set the vision, set measurable goals. Okay. And then go in and do it. And, and, and if and there's a, there's a journey with that, obviously. And you know, if uh, anybody, I'm 
I'm not, we have a, we have a team of experts that, that are sustainable experts. We, we have a line of business that consult with the largest and the smallest companies. It doesn't have to be a certain size for us. Um, if anybody has any questions or, or would like more information, uh, please reach out. We have, we have a whole team that can get into a lot more detail uh, than, than I can. So as you may notice, Joe is not here for this part of the podcast. We had some technical difficulties. His internet line actually got cut by a contractor. So um, in his absence, I want to thank him for being a guest on the podcast today. It was a really fantastic conversation and I appreciate his time. And I know that all of you um, do as well. So despite him not being here, thank you, Joe, for your time and for the conversation. And for the folks who are watching or listening, if you want to learn more about Schneider Electric, you can go to se.com and there will be notes and links in the show notes as well. And per usual, thank you for listening to Canada's podcast. Like, comment, and subscribe to all our channels to get the latest podcasts from entrepreneurs across Canada. This podcast is brought to you by Schneider Electric, supporting Canadian businesses with innovative energy management and automation solutions. Schneider Electric, your digital partner for sustainability and efficiency.